Director, story artist, and animation producer Steve Hickner began his career in cartoons the way many aspiring artists before him got their starts. He arrived in L.A. without knowing a soul. He knocked on many doors without result. And finally, one door swung open. And his career began. In Mr. Hickner's case, the portal through which he climbed was Filmation Animation Studios in the middle of the San Fernando Valley. But the road leading to that portal had started years before when Steve was a cartoon-loving high school student who created his own 8mm films. Training at New York University's film school soon followed, and then that stint at Filmation. After that, There was a years-long run at Disney Feature Animation, followed by an even longer stay at Steven Spielberg's Amblimation Studio in London. It was there that Mr. Hickner worked in almost every job, from training in-betweeners to building animation desks to producing full-length features, every job that the studio offered. Since the mid-1990s, Steve Hickner has been part of DreamWorks Animation, working on dozens of features, television shows, and shorts and also serving as director on B-Movie and The Prince of Egypt. He continues to direct and storyboard at DreamWorks Animation, most recently directing the short The Book of Dragons. We spoke in the conference room of the Animation Guild on October 3rd, 2013. We are talking today to Mr. Stephen Hickner about his life, career, and his book, Animating Your Career which he penned recently, and we are going to talk about along with his life and career. So, Mr. Hickner, tell me what prompted you to get into animation in the first place, because everybody has a slightly different story. What's yours? Well, I, I think, like most of the people in the union, probably, I, I started drawing when I was a very young kid and it just never left me and I always thought that I might want to work in comic books and one time in high school my we had to do a paper and I did mine on cartooning and the teacher when I got it back it said in red at the top see me which of course was the sign of a surefire F (laughs) and uh, immediately I was terrified like oh no this is an F I thought it was good so after class I had to go up and talk to the teacher and he said I want you to go talk to uh, Jim Myers uh, or Mr. Myers and now this was even worse because this wasn't even my teacher that he wanted me to go talk to after school so after school I went to him and he said have you ever thought about doing animation and I said this is an an what Eng- would prompt him to say something like that? An, Eng- an English teacher, and I said, no. I said, well, one of the students, Tom Brielman, has a Super 8 camera with single frame. And since you seem to like to draw, if you did an animated film, I would show you how to put it in the camera. And you could borrow his. So you started in high school. Yeah. And so that that very day, I went home yeah. and uh, started an animated film. And I didn't know anything. And back then, uh, I, I'm from West... Did you Virginia. have... A pegboard, or did you just? Were you I, just I had, slapping the. I had. I, I knew stuff. nothing about animation. There was one, there were two books at the West Hartford Public Library. One of them was the uh, the animated films of Zagreb, and the other one was um, a, a Kodak book, and that was it. And so, the yeah, first thing yeah, I yeah. I realized, I said, I I need to make this. So that it's registered somehow. So I got. So it's not floating all over the exactly. place. Exactly, and and uh, you may remember back in those days, in photos albums, they had these little things you put in the corners. So I used to put my drawings in the photo thing to uh, anchor it. To anchor yeah, to yeah. register it, and it took me no time at all to realize that this isn't going to work because I couldn't see the drawing underneath. So then I took my t- table and I spread the leaf you know where the leaf goes I spread the table out and got a pane of glass and put it down and put a light underneath it Hmm. and then so I was like reinventing animation on my own and then I realized that that with the the photo corners wasn't working and so I asked my father to get a piece of um, 
uh, plexiglass, which he then dr drilled three holes for dowels, and I used a three-hole punch, and that's how I began to do registration. But I didn't know about flipping, and I, I didn't know about bottom pegs. I thought you did it on the top. But the first film was that Walter Foster art book about no, the. The first film was a disaster, but it it only once you I saw learn from your mistakes. But once I saw it move, I was hooked. So that was in that was in high school. Yeah, and like seventeen probably. I read somebody say, and it was some famous either storyboard artist or comic book artist said he learned to draw in math class because he just sat in the back of the room <laughs> drawing. <laughs> which isn't probably what you're supposed to do, but no. he did it. Um, okay, so you graduate from high school, and so what's your next move? Because you're still interested in animation. Yeah, well, I, I like, probably like other people, uh, I, I couldn't fully commit to that because my mother thought, you know, you're going to be unemployed if you do this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's no possible chance for someone from West Hartford, Connecticut to go... Yeah. to make animation. So I went to uh, Florida State University as a biology major, Yeah. and I took a film class, and in my second year, I realized that I didn't love that. I really had to go. You didn't like biology. I, I liked biology. I still love animals, but I didn't like it enough as much as I liked oh, I... Um, drawing. So I called my father because and uh, he looked it up and said back then there were only three programs really in the country there was NYU USC UCLA for film so I applied to all three of them mm -hmm. and this was in uh, like October and then in December I was accepted I was accepted into all three schools oh, but, that's not, good. but not in the film program because like USC only st only started people in the fall, and I didn't want to wait around to the fall. And you're, you had done one year at this point, right? Yeah, and so you're I was coming in as a sophomore, halfway through the sophomore, because I was going to go. Ha and so NYU let me do that, so I transferred mid-year as a sophomore. So I was two oh, and a half yeah. years at NYU. So how did you like NYU? I loved it. Loved it. And you're in the city, right? So yeah, yeah. Right downtown it was fantastic. So, yeah, and it's, you talked to me earlier about, so tell me a little bit about the NYU experience and, and where that catapulted you to. Well, the, the first day I went to NYU was absolutely terrifying because I went in halfway through the year and I was mid in this course. It was called Sight and Sound. In the first semester, you have to make si uh, silent movies. In the second semester, you are allowed to use non-synchronous sound. So you could make... Add music sound and effects, sound effects music. or voiceover, but that's all. No dialogue, no sync to the mouth. That's right. So the first day I go to class, and the first thing we did was see the films of the previous semester. And there was, to me, as this, you know, a hick from uh, West Hartford, I felt like there was nudity in these student films. And oh, my God. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. To me, that was an art film with a capital A. It's like... A, and... The borderline pornography. The level of precociousness of the students was mind blowing. Well, a lot of them, a lot of them were probably from Manhattan, right? And Very they had long. seen everything. They had seen all these movies. And that first day, I, I really felt like I had moved into a foreign language class because they were talking about Howard Hawks and Truffaut and you wonder, all these. Who the hell are these people? I didn't know who any of them were. Any of them. And uh, I realized that I had to do some fast catching up, which is what I did. So you started pulling all-nighters at your local revival houses, right? Yes, because back then they actually had those. Yeah, they those had are some gone. out here, too. Those are gone now. Yeah, well, this, you know, they, the technology and streaming videos and mm -hmm. DVDs, which are probably gone for the most part, yep. have supplanted them. So you did the full... So you've, you burned through that whole program in two and a half years then. Yeah. Well, I had done all my liberal arts, all my um, all GE classes. Stuff. Yeah, you had the at, general ed out of the way. At Florida State, so I only was taking film classes at NYU. So, that which was good because uh, that school was hard. If I, I looked at what, like the math classes and history and psychology and other things my friends were taking and I thought oh boy I'm glad I did this before I came here because yeah. this school is hard and 
So you graduate now. Animation has sort of fallen into the wayside here. You're doing li- you're you're concentrating on live action yeah. filmmaking. But I was taking animation classes. I was taking them both at the same oh, time. So you were doing were yeah. you doing life drawing and were you doing animation? Well, no, I, I was, it was all film. There was no life drawing. That came uh, when I moved out here. So animation and live action. Okay, so you graduate from NYU, and then boom, you hop to LA, probably. Yeah. Right? In fact, I didn't even wait. Once I turned in my last thing, I didn't even wait for graduation. You I was skied out. gone. And because uh, I didn't care anything about going to the commencement exercises or anything, I wanted to get to Hollywood. Right. And the uh, that as as I write in the book that that moment that I remember it vividly that when I saw that sign, Los Angeles 500 miles. I was driving out with my friend, and we were having the best time on that trip. And the minute we saw that sign, yeah, we were silent because it's like, oh, the fun is over. Now we got to get a job. So how did you get your first job? That's what I want to know. Well, we went and knocked on a million doors. I didn't know what I was doing, and uh, I, that naivete was a godsend because I... You're not intimidated because you don't know enough to be intimidated. Yeah, I don't know anything. So I got rejected by everybody, and I didn't even have a portfolio. And uh, then I went to Filmation... But now, how did you get into Filmation? I had Usually a, people get rejected at Disney and then they go to Hanna-Barbera or Filmation or one of the others. I don't know why I uh, I picked Filmation, but I, I took my student film and I had my 60 millimeter projector in my film. And, and I, no portfolio? No portfolio. I had my film and uh, I took it and Kay Wright was in charge of developing talent and he looked at my film, which was very crude, but I think he saw a spark in me of some kind. Uh, whatever it is, he was my guardian angel. And, and Kay Wright was developing, was he uh, doing uh, boards or he was directing at that point? He was directing um, Quackula at that time for Filmation, which was where all the young uh, guys were on that show. He was like training them. So you start on Quackula. Well, I started in the video room, shooting video. I wasn't even in between. And that was when the studio was in Reseda on the corner. That's right. Sherman Way uh, and Lindley. Yeah. A famous famous site among a dwindling number of artists who remember it fondly. Yeah. I got to say, Lou Scheimer was in there. I was there on and off for five years. He was incredibly good to me. Everybody, everybody was, but uh, so he was a super nice guy. So what did guy. K teach you exactly? I mean, he he started you in the video room, and then where do you go from there? Do you go into in betweening? Do you go into well, uh, apprentice storyboarding? The the answer is yeah, uh, yes. I was doing in betweening in the evenings or whatever I had free time. I was practicing, but I was also writing a spec script for one of the shows. Yeah, which in this case was Sport Billy, and because of my desk was fortuitous. My office, which was a closet, was fortuitously right across from uh, Don Christensen. Yeah. I got to be uh, good friends with him. Who was, uh, who was the co-head of the studio. Yeah. So. And it was funny because everybody was afraid of, of Don Christensen. They thought he was really tough. Chris was a sweetie. He was nothing but good to me. Yeah. And I asked him if he would read my script. He did. He liked it. And so he said, I can't get you into the writing department because that's Arthur Nadell's uh, territory. Oh, Arthur was really territorial. Yes. And so he got me into storyboarding, and that was a fiasco. I just didn't have the chops yet. Yeah. And so I ended up back in video, but they needed someone to do fixes, storyboard fixes. And because I was right there, I started doing fixes for for, uh, Chris. He yeah. would do the rust, and I would just clean yeah. them up. Yeah. And little by little, I did that for six months, and at the end of six months, I was back in the storyboard department. Yeah. And by now, you've improved your chops. And learned something. I didn't know anything about... Hookups and... And, and doing things economically, you know, which you, which you had to do. But no, I didn't know anything about uh, storyboard. So doing fixes on other people's boards probably taught you a hell of a lot. Huge, huge. You're going, oh, they do it this way. Oh, they do it this way. In the same way, shooting video and seeing everybody in the studio's animation was invaluable for a sense of timing. Yeah. 
So I, after I say I was in the right place twice. And you're there. For, you're there off and on for five years. Were you? Were the layoffs uh, lengthy, or were they yeah, just basically? Eight, in '82, it was. Oh yeah, 80, yeah. We talked about that. that Ten weeks. There worked. was a there was a work stoppage that went on. And I, I finally happened to me too. I finally um, got some work at uh, Hanna Barbera doing uh, storyboards from K. Yeah. And he moved and, over there at that yeah. point. Yeah. And then I the think strike he hit. Sort of ended his career at, at Hanna Barbera. And then the strike hit, and then I had to go out. So it's like, really, I just. And that was I the eighty-two just, strike. Yeah. Yeah, that was a long one. Yeah, I hope there'll never be another because it wasn't good. They're not good. They're uh, kind of ugly. I kind of think, at least structurally, it's more difficult to pull off these days. So, and also the times are different. But so you were briefly in Hanna Barbera, and then you had a huge. Uh, dry spell where you're not doing anything because there's a strike and then probably scrambling around to find work. So what's your next job after that? Do you finally well, get back that, to Hanna Barbera? That, was, uh, that, that um, year where I essentially didn't work taught me a big lesson, which was the top people always find work. And I realized that I wasn't in that level and I had to get there. So during that time, I made the decision I had to get into Disney. Mm -hmm. I had to learn how to do animation right because I knew how to do it fast and I knew how to do it cheap, but I didn't know how to do it well. You knew how to do the TV, the yeah. low low budget TV variety, but you didn't know how to do the uh, feature animation. Variety. I wanted to know how to do it correctly, and yeah. I, and at that point, as you remember, the, it was Disney and nothing. Occasionally, Bluth would, I mean, um, uh, well, Bluth was starting up as well, but Backstreet would have a. a movie so now we're talking about eighty three, eighty four, right? Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah. I was on He-Man. That was the first syndicated show. That that really split the atom. That that was a big game changer because it was 65 episodes, and as you know, up to that point, it had only been 13. Well, oh, that's when they got into the marketing of toys and all yeah. that good stuff, and that's when it really started to take off at Filmation. So, um, yeah, I remember it because I started being on the board, and Bud was always talking about. Other studios were laying people off, hiring for s smaller orders, and Bud would come in and report that Filmation had these 65 episode orders and people were working year round. Yeah. Which was unheard of because everybody was sort of tied to uh, the TV, Saturday morning TV season. You'd work for six or seven or eight months and you'd be off for four mm -hmm. or five or six months. That's right. And you just learned to hoard your money and bridge the gap between seasons. But you know what, that, the, the, the year that I hardly worked, in the fact when I first got in the business, it was kind of like that six months on, six months off, was one of the best things that ever happened to me. It was very difficult, but because I didn't know any better, that was my first job, I figured that's what it was like in the real world. You work for six months and then you're off for six months and you have to... Scramble around. Yeah. And... What that taught me is something that if I had just gotten a full-time job that worked nonstop, I would not have appreciated uh, the work and I would not have been planning, oh, I might be laid off soon. Mm -hmm. And now the market, again, I tell young people, I said, there's the, the, the three things you need to think about in any job now is one is the pay and Titles are going to go up and down. You're oh, not yeah. going to. You're going. You're going to be this and that. You're going to be, be nice to everybody because the guy that's working for you today will be hiring you tomorrow. Yes. That's one of the lessons I try to impart. And some people buy it, others not. But oh, it's essential. Oh yeah. Well, Plus, it's just good. Sense. Good to be a good person and not be yeah. a, a jerk. Yeah. Always play the pop. Uh, yeah. Do the popularity contest because. There's no reason, I mean, in this job I hear stories uh, that would curl your hair. But Yeah, and, so, and you... So uh, how did you get into Disney? Because that was the goal of well, the chalice. The, the goal, the first thing I did was I, I, I uh, took Glenn Vilpoo's class at the anime, at Brandis Institute out there in, uh, where is it, Thousand Oaks or wherever it was. Way out. Uh, where, Canoga Park, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, out in the but, West Valley. Yeah. So I, I took that because Glenn was in charge, was a layout guy at Disney. Oh, yeah. And he was on the review board. And I thought, good, if I take his class, I'll be that less 
anonymous. So I started taking this class and it was very apparent that my skills weren't good enough, that going once a week wasn't going to do it. But I didn't have any money because it was very expensive to take that class. It was like... Um, you should have taken the Glenn Vilpoo classes here. I they think did, they, they didn't cheaper. have them. Well, he's, yeah, he's been in and out of here. But, Back uh, then, uh, I, don't, I don't know if the union... I later did take Glenn at the union, yeah. but I don't think he was... Uh, he might not have been here in those days. Because I think he was teaching elsewhere, but this he's is been here for a long time. This is 83. Yeah, I think it was before he got here. I, I did take Glenn at the Union sometime later. But I, then I also enrolled in a class at Valley College because I could take a class for like $10 for the semester. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And wasn't Glenn, though. No, but it was actually good because it was another teacher at another approach. Style. And so I wasn't learning only one way. And right. I think that was that was good, but it allowed me to do life drawing Tuesday and Thursday. So you're two classes a week. Yeah, and then I, I realized it still isn't enough. I'm not going to get to be good enough that I got to have a sketchbook of animals. So Saturday became go to the zoo day. And you draw your brains and out. I draw go to the zoo. And then I realized it still isn't enough. I'm not getting good enough. So Sunday was the day I would go with, to the park. And, and draw. So you were drawing four days a week. All the friggin' time. And I, well, I was drawing Monday through Friday on He-Man, and then I was doing this in on the weekends. Two nights, and then on the weekend. Yes. Yeah, so you I, had a full schedule. But I was, I mean, I I was on boot camp. I said I I got one. I was thinking spring of '84 is my date. I'm going to try to get in. Yeah. And so I got one year. Yeah. yeah. And actually, I think it was like 14 months. And so around. February. And you're building a portfolio. Yep, which is the great thing about the class classes, is building my portfolio. And so around February, I put, I brought, uh, Larry White was a friend of mine, and he came over to my apartment, and I put all my stuff on the floor, and he t told me, he said, put this in, don't put this in. He says, work on this. So. And he's already over there. He's already there. So he looked at my portfolio, and then for the next month, I focused on just what he said I needed. And then um, in March, I submitted, and that, I remember vividly this, on Friday night, I was at a party, and I saw, this is sad to say, because he's gone now, Joe Ramp was oh, yeah, at this yeah, party, yeah. and Joe Ramp came up to me, and he said, so I hear you're starting at Disney. <laughs> and I said, well, I haven't heard anything yet. He goes, oh, yeah, they looked at your portfolio today. You'll get a call on Monday. And sure enough, on Monday, I got well, a call. Well, he's probably on the review committee. Yeah, on Monday, I got a call, and I was I was in. That was it. <laughs> so I have super fond memories of Joe just for that. I knew but Joe so, real well in the early 80s. He was one of the nicest guys. I know. And one of the funniest guys. Hysterically funny. That's our the thing we were talking about yesterday, that life isn't fair. That Life is what it is. The and, guy uh, was a super nice guy. No, yeah. no one, and to everyone at, liked Joe. To die at 45, I don't think he had one person that didn't like him. There might have been somebody somewhere, but I never met them. Yeah. So, yeah, he was just uh, unbelievably pleasant mm -hmm. and unbelievably talented. He was a friend to all. Yeah. Oh, He's, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was just, and, and basically, you know, he, he was the guy that was instrumental in getting Brenda Chapman up to... Up yeah. to uh, Pixar. Yeah. Pixar. So yeah, it's anyway. It's too sad thinking about that. So your first day at Disney. That was March. I think it was March nineteenth, nineteen eighty four. And the day that I walked on that lot was one of the most exciting things in my entire life because I wanted the first day you were there. Yeah, because I wanted to. We're, I loved Disney since I was a kid, and the fact that I walked on that lot and now I work at Disney was incredible and. And to actually go have my office in D Wing, which, as you know, was the wing where all the uh, vaulted, uh, yeah, nine old men were in there. Yeah, I think that I was in uh, D fourteen, which uh, someone told me might have been to Frank Thomas's office. Yeah, he was down towards the end. Oh, okay. Well, then that wasn't. I was. I was right. And Mark Davis, but the, that he was down there when I knew him. But he, he, you know, I think that they moved around. There was yeah. a period of time where they moved around a bit. They didn't move around a lot. That was a studio where you were a veteran and you just stayed in one office for like 15 or 20 years. You just never moved. Not like DreamWorks where yeah. every 15 minutes mm -hmm. you're off. 
You're you're in a new space. When you move on a new show, you're in a new place. Yeah. And they didn't do that then. So, but okay. So you're in D Wing, and so what do they throw you into the pool to do? Well, I, I was working with Tom Ferreter. You remember Tom? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was working in Tom Ferreter's uh, unit, and. Uh, just doing in-betweens. But I was very lucky because Mike McKinney, mm -hmm. who was in one of Andreas's assistants, who Andreas, of course, designed the characters for Black Cauldron. So it was really advantageous for me, because that's how I met Andreas, right. to have him be coming in the room every day. Another lucky happenstance. And I could have him look at my work, and even though I wasn't working for him, and I could learn from him. And yes. And so, yeah, I think you talk about that in the book as well, that uh, being in the right place at the right time with the right people always is useful. And so, taking advantage of it, because a lot of people uh, get those same opportunities and waste them. Yeah. So, yeah, you gotta, you got to jump on the, on the moment when the moment is hot. I remember the first, one of the first things I ever did at Disney when I got there was I got my little phone book, and yeah. I took a highlighter. And I highlighted all the names of the people I was going to go, all the ones I knew that I heard of, all the people I wanted yeah. to go see. And then I took my Illusion of Life book and... Had them sign it. I would go, I would, and that was my excuse to go and talk to these people. And then we moved over to Flower Street. I took my book with me and did that dutiful well, list at WDI. You're really fortunate in one way. You were in the original animation building. Yes. In a sense, I knew people through my parents that were at Hyperion. You know, wow. you go way back, the group that was in Hyperion that moved over to Burbank. Burbank, Hyperion, if you were starting yeah. at Hyperion, that was like the holy grail. Yeah. And then, uh, and now, time passes and now the holy grail is, did you work in the original animation yeah. building or the one in the Burbank? on the Burbank lot, because the, the original animation building was, you know, Hyperion. Well, there's less and less of those guys. Oh, yeah. They're, I can't imagine much, how many. There's, there's one guy I'm trying to interview who animated there in the 30s, and uh, he was there until the 60s. I think his name is Don Musk, and or Don Lusk, and he is, like, going to be 100. In fact, I think he wow. just turned 100. And... Uh, He's probably the last animator standing who worked on Snow White. So is there is there anybody at Disney now who actually worked on the in the animation building in Burbank? There can't be There's Disney. only a couple. Bernie Mattinson. Yeah. Bernie Mattinson, John Musker, Ron Clements, and I think there's a handful of others. But for the most part Mark most, Ken, is he still there, so I think Ken's still there, yeah, he would have. Mm -hmm. Uh and um you know, a, a lot of them have been gone. Oh, Dale Bear is still there. So, yeah, Dale. Dale worked in the animation building. Uh, there's probably... Eight? <laughs> eight to twelve, something like that. But that would be about it. Uh, I mean, you're going to get to the point where who who worked on Flower Street? You know, yeah. that, that... Right. You go far enough and it'll, everybody will be the hat building and, and that'll be that. But... You were there on the animation building and in betweening. So, how did. I was one of the last guys to leave that building because everybody moved over to Flower Street and I was painting cells on Black Cauldron to the very, very end. So, I was one of the last people to leave. And one of the last things I did when I was leaving the, uh, the thing, you know how they had the list of the directory of all the people's names? I went to the thing and I said, you know what? They're just going to throw these out. Oh, yeah. So. They, I reached in to get it, and I realized that they just put them on top of each other. Brother. They never took the old ones out of there. They just <laughs> there were there was a stack of them there. So you took some. So and I just took one. I wanted, I a wanted souvenir. the souvenir. Do you still have it? Yes, I went. I wanted the one from the day that I began. And you got it. And I got it. I still. I, I must be one of the only ones that has that. March eighty four. It must be the one of the only ones who has one of those directory. Well, I'm sure you are, <laughs> you know, unless they have one somewhere, you know, digitized or something. But uh, so you were one of the last guys to go to Flower Street. Uh, 
and when you got to Flower Street, now you moved over from you moved over from animation, and it uh, went into story development uh, at uh, some well, point in there. Well, I, I helped on Sport Goofy. That's when I switched over. But that, that's about when I met you when I went on over to Flowers because I didn't know you at. Um, yeah, it's because I was on a different floor. So. Yeah, and and also I met you through Steve Zupkes. Yeah, yeah. Well, Steve, Steve and I to this day are still good friends. So because Steve was really uh, active in the union, and so that's how I met oh, you. Oh, you got a little active. You you did some contributions to the paper and all that <laughs> stuff. So um, short lived. But then you yeah well you. I think you uh, moved on to England shortly thereafter, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. You you move over to you move over to uh, Flower Street and those low windowless factory shelves that everybody was occupying with the uh, few windows around the edges. And I was in the middle, of course. What was what was your impression of? Because uh, you jumped from a custom built. Uh, building design for artists to this jerry-rigged factory shell in Glendale. You know uh, people people really complained, it, but I didn't care because at that time I was working on Grey Moss Detective, and to me it was a much better movie. Yeah. And so I would rather work on a good movie in the lousy building than a lousy movie in a good building. Yeah, yeah. And so, what was your impression? I mean, the Black Cauldron, did you know it wasn't the creme de la creme when you were working on it, or did you just get caught up in the forest I, at the time you were... I, I was just thrilled to work on a feature, and to me, the quality level was so much higher than anything I had ever worked on before. Yeah. So it I was mean, a... Shot I for loved, shot, it was great. I loved working on The Black Cauldron. I mean, it may not be as good a movie as perhaps we might have liked, but I loved working on it, i got to say. I yeah, yeah. really enjoyed my time on it. And then, okay, so you're on, you're on the Great Mouse. Now, are you still working as in-between, or you're an assistant? I, I was, I was uh, working with Kathy Zielinski. Oh, okay. I was an assistant. And? And that was really good, because uh, Kathy was doing fidget. And how long? And so you were with her for the whole picture? Pretty much. And then you, much. how did, now, how did you jump? Because somewhere in there, they started working on Sport Goofy. Yeah, and... and, and Don, I mean, Don, uh, Ed Hansen came to me and, and asked me if I wanted, they was putting together a group, uh, Matt O'Callaghan, Joe Lynn Cicero, and uh, yeah. Gary Temple yeah. to work on it. So we, we went on to uh, Sport Goofy. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't, that was, uh, Darryl, was Gerald Van Sitters directing that? Or I know Tad Stones had done a version of it yeah, early and, on. Yeah, and so they, they wanted to fix some things, and, uh, I, you know, maybe we made it, Two percent better, or maybe it was two percent different, but it wasn't significant. Yeah, but so, but that's how you got into storyboard. But most importantly, I, I we got I got to work with Ward Kimball. That was the that was the big win on that. Now, how how did that come about, and how long was Ward on it, and what was your interaction with him? He would come probably twice a week, and uh, Ed Hansen brought him in to try because I think there was a sense with Sport Goofy that it wasn't it didn't feel old time Disney enough. Right. And so they brought in Ward to to help us and for me it was just how great is that? What a fantastic spoil of riches to have him to get to learn from him. And it, it's funny because Ward is like the last if you want to make something really Disney, He's Ward's like the, the last guy. Yeah. But he actually was very serious about the thing, and he, uh, you know, put his own, you know, because he was uh, iconoclast, he put his own sensibilities and said, we're going to m- try to make this like uh, Jack Kinney, you know, how to ride a horse kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. he was absolutely in that mindset of trying to make a Disney short like they would have. And what was his contribution? He would go over our storyboards, and we would talk story, and he would Throw out analyze ideas. the animation. Yeah. Yeah. And two days a week. Two days a week, and that was. How long did that last? I'd say maybe six months. Yeah. And he, I'll remember it my whole life. He went over and worked on the uh, stuff uh, for the General Motors Pavilion, yeah. and worked. So he was he was floating around. Got booted out by one of the regimes at Disney and then uh, well he told us what happened the, what what drove him out the of granite Disney. portrait did he tell you about the 
the granite portrait that he sent a memo around about that uh, oh, yeah. he got into a fight with uh, Ron Miller and I think particularly Card Walker and they decided uh, they didn't need that so he was uh, served his walking papers at some point which I just think wow you win the Academy Award and then mm-hmm. shortly after you find yourself on the street that's what? John Ford got fired for Mr. Roberts. No one is safe. No, no one is safe. It's it's always the way. We were talking George Cukor got fired from Gone with a Wind. Yeah. Politics, it's always with us. Um okay, so you're you're boarding on Sport Goofy and uh, are and you then still Then I began to production manage on that as well. And are you are you still doing any uh, work on uh The Great Mouse or is that done? No, that I'm time? that's done. But I was because there was no one like organizing it, I kind of moved into production so, managing on it. So you became the uh, de facto, de, you know. And and that's that took you. That this is what I want to ask you. You're you're on Sport Goofy, and you're production managing, and you're on the ground floor, and you developed a story with a, mm-hmm. with the story team, and then. When that thing is on its way and completed, where did you go after that? Because at some point you ended up yeah. with the Roger Rabbit unit. But well, how that, did all that happen? That's how I transitioned actually into production. Because from that, then they had another thing that's Richard Dreyfus, funny you don't look 200 Constitution uh, special. Mm-hmm. And so I went, like as the production manager, kind of on that with uh, Dave Michener. And that that was and there was animation in that. Yeah, there was like five animation. or six minutes of animation in that, and from that, then I asked Peter if there was any way if there was going to be an LA unit uh, unit I'd like to be involved on Roger Rabbit. Yeah, and, and he said, he You're said my guy. he said, you know, um, we don't know right now, and within a week or. It felt like a week. Maybe it was two weeks at the absolute longest I was on it. I was the second person uh, brought in uh, along with Ron Roach. Ron Roach was first. Well, if you don't count Del- Dale and Jane Bear. Right. Ron was the first one they brought in as the product manager, and then I was working with Ron to set up the L.A. unit. And then around September or something, Ron went to um, London yeah. For a while, and he, he didn't want to stay there. He came back, so Don Hahn asked me if I would go, and I said... Oh, so that's how you got to London. Absolutely. Because, because Ron didn't want to stay. Yes. And then, uh, okay, so Ron Rocha comes back. You go to London. And, and that how, changed my life. How much, of the, how much of the movie was still there to... Was there still left to do? How much animation was still left to do by the time you got over there? A it? huge amount. I would be surprised if they had more than a third done. And this was, I got there November 7th, 1987, and I finished uh, right around Easter. So they really cranked. Oh. Were you, were you sort of involved in some of the cranking? How did you get the footage out if they had just sort of been, of course, they got a lot more people. used to going slowly and meticulously. So. They got a lot more people. That's how they did it. Really? They threw and, more bodies at it. Yeah, and everything is on ones on that whole movie. Yeah, so sure. So it's huge. It's a huge amount of uh, work on that. So, and you're so you're on that approximately six or seven months in London. Yeah. And and then you stay on in London, but no, uh, I, I came back after London, but I met the Amblin people. And that's where you met Spielberg. Yeah, that's where I met them, and I said, and more Frank Marshall and um, Robert Watts. Right. And that's when I said I got to go work with these guys. Yeah. And so I went back on Little Mermaid, but I kept in contact with them Yeah. and said, you know, if you get a studio going, I'm interested. And then in June 89, I went to London. Well, so you were on Mermaid. So what were you doing on Mermaid? Were you uh, back assistant I was work? Uh, or clean up. I was in charge of clean up. Oh, okay. So you were heading that up. Yeah. Well, that was a good picture to be involved in. Oh, it was a really good movie. Yeah. I mean, fabulous film. Yeah. So, all right. So... You're wrapping up, or you're close to wrapping up The Little Mermaid, and then where did you get the phone call? And, and to me, it's, it's amazing that you were the guy, among a couple of others, that went over and set up the Amblimation Studio in London. So what did you have to do 
and what was your sort of portfolio when they said, okay, we're hiring you, you're the guy, and uh, how did that all unfold? Well, I had been calling him for a year, and and uh, finally it happened, and you know... You wore them down. <laughs> yeah, and I almost blew the interview uh, one time, and I had to call back and say, you know what, uh, I, I really, really want this, because I, I thought... I, I did a crummy job of selling myself because I'm not great at selling myself. Yeah. And well, I, I needed. Apparently, to. you was good enough because. Well, I had to call back and do it again. So they brought you in for another interview. Well, I, I it was I was calling him in London. Oh, okay. So. So. That's we're talking about the spring of '89. And that was Cindy Woodburn. She called me back and said, "You." You got to call back again because you blew it. You got to do, and so I did. I called back again. And she was one of the people at Hamlet. Yes, and she was, uh, she was one of the people who uh, was the production manager on, on, um, on American Tale Two. Oh, okay. So she helped me get that job because I wouldn't have called back, and I would have oh, blown it. So really? She, she saved me. Yeah. But she, uh, she thought there's more to. It. She knew you, so she. Yeah, knew there was she knew more. I could do it. She was. The, she knew there was more there than met the eye in the yeah. interview. Well, what you say you blew it. I want to know because I think this is useful. How? What did you do? What do you think you were doing that blew it and made? I, well, I wasn't blew it? saying I can absolutely do this and I'll kill doing it. Uh, you know, I'll be the best person you can imagine. Yeah, I wasn't doing that. What were you doing? You were being ambivalent. I was saying, you know, I'll, I'll, this is a big job, and I'm going to... Uh, Give it know. my best. Yeah. But I don't know. <laughs> yeah. They don't want to show, they don't want anybody showing self-doubt, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, they want somebody who says they're going to do it. They want somebody who might be wrong, but is never in doubt. Yes. And, and so, you evinced a little bit of doubt, and that was yeah. why she called you up and yeah, said... Yeah, said, guy, got to go sell yourself again. So the second time around, you went in positive yeah. and forceful. Yeah, said I, I could do this, and uh, I, I would never have believed how difficult that move, first movie was going to be. Absolutely, uh, never had anything like it. But you were over there to set up the whole studio. So, had did they have a building at the point you came over? Yeah, but I, I was going in there on Saturday and Sunday, wiring the floor, building the desks. Really? Yeah, it was a seven day a week, and. To get American Tale 2 done when we finally were doing it, yeah. from uh, right before Memorial Day until we were done or in the early November, I didn't have a single day off and I was working 12 to 14 hours a day because I would get there at 6.30 in the morning yeah. and, I would, and at 5 o'clock, London time, L.A. would come alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then... That mm -hmm. was another four hours, so I was working from 6.30 till 9 o'clock every day. Was there any burnout on your part? Because I've been I was, around crews that work that much, and you get, uh, usually on the sixth or seventh day of 12 hours, they're like, they're sort of in a trance. Well, I was like 33 or something at the time, and... And uh, so you were, f and plus you're doing different stuff. You're not just, if you had been doing... No, no. In between, we were. Desk. I was putting down fires every day that were. Well, like, so you got to move around. That's. I think you can. You know, I'm of the opinion you can work longer and harder. Yeah. If you're not doing one repetitive yeah. task over and over, because I've 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 seen a lot of crews that work long hours, and they all turn into zombies because they're sitting there staring at a light board. Now, of course, a computer screen, and you can only do that so much, and then the production. You know the, the the production efficiency goes like this, so I'm sure that you encountered that. I, I encountered stuff on that movie that I've never heard of. Any there was one artist. We had this huge scene that was really important, and he decided uh, that evening a good idea would be to store his drawings on top of the trash can. Well, the next and morning, they got thrown out. Yeah, the next morning we came in. And it was gone. And the first thing we did was check the dumpster out back. But unfortunately... That was gone. That was, was the empty. day that it was trashed. So uh, another guy, Martin Elvin and I, we drove out to the dump. dump. 
and spent the morning wading through garbage. Did you find garbage. it? No. We found, we found dream, uh, emblemation stuff, but we never found that scene. And, and so when we again. left, that it was an inside thing. And when we left to go back in the car, I said, Martin, we stink. I said, not a little. We really stink. I said, we can't go back to work. We have to go. Go. I, said, to I gotta go to my it. house. You gotta go to your house. You gotta go take a shower and change your clothes. Yeah, and scrub down. And <laughs> and uh, the 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 the. Did I mean, he learn not to uh, you put know, drawings on the? Uh, I trap? never, I never really said anything to that animator because I didn't have to because the. Uh, I mean, the, that assistant animator. I never had to say anything because the animator did it for me. Because the animator was furious because he had to redo his scene. Because he... <laughs> and the symbolic gesture of, of me going to do that yeah. paid dividends, I would say, on that movie tremendously because it, it sent the message... We're serious here. There is nothing... I won't do to get this movie done in time. Yeah. This movie is going to be done on that thing. And you did. And we did. And boy, it was, it was uh, close. But the we're back. Our next movie was the closest one I've ever worked on. Really? Oh yeah. I remember talking to Matthew Tevin and uh, Robert Crawford, without whom they wouldn't finish either of those two movies. And they were working on we're back. We were in. London, but they were in L.A. Right. doing stuff for We're Back in their hotel rooms, and they said, we can see the poster out the window that says, you know, November whatever d date it was coming out, which was like two weeks away, and he said, we're not done. We're not done with this movie yet. We still got some to go, but they made the release date, right? Yeah, not that anybody cared, because it was... DOA, I'm afraid. Yeah, it didn't do very well. That would be release, kind. But uh, well, there are underperformers. We, I, I have the distinction of of making as dinosaur movie with Steven Spielberg the year Jurassic Park came out that didn't make money. That's right. So this was a this was a dinosaur movie that he was attached to that didn't do as well yeah, as the as live action version. It's Jurassic Park. Yeah. If you'd done half as well as Jurassic Park, you would have been heroes. <laughs> Would have been heroes. So it would have been. At what point? Now, okay, you finish. We're back. Prompted Stephen to want to move the studio here. He's just tired of flying to London. It. Our movies were not as good as what Disney was doing, and we felt like we needed to be closer to Stephen to make that happen. All right. And, uh, I mean, for me, I was thrilled because I loved working with Steven Spielberg. It, uh, to this day, he is the most creative person I've ever met in the industry, hands give me, down. Give me a couple of examples. Well, the, the thing that, I, that most surprised me about him is how open he is to changing ideas. Is he'll throw out an idea. He's incredibly fertile imagination, always coming up with ideas. And then sometimes you'll have to go, no, 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 Stephen, uh, this was a good idea. Because he'll be ready to throw away to come up with another new idea. Yeah, yeah. Is, and that was incredibly exciting. Plus, uh, his visual recall was incredible. He would, he would look at the story reels, and on the way to work, driving to Amblin from his house, he would be on the phone to us, to giving us notes on the story reel, and he would be calling... Uh, from memory. From memory, shot for shot, what, the, what had happened in the thing. He said, you know that shot, you got a close-up like this, why don't you do the... Shot for shot, he was is, is as if he was watching the movie right then. Wow. Yeah. Total Recall. That's uh, useful to have when you're a, a director, producer, creator. Yeah, he's incredibly uh, visually literate, unbelievably. And okay, so you come back with Amblin, and you're going to do Cats. Yeah. And that you 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 set up to do that, and that went along for what about five months, and then. Well, I came back in uh, June, and in November of '84, that's when I talked to Jeffrey. Was it eighty? Was it? Was it eighty? Oh, '94. I'm sorry, '94. I came back June '94, and in uh, November '94, I talked to Jeffrey. Yeah. And that was the first thing about maybe going to DreamWorks. And uh, and at that time, 
you know, they hadn't quite worked it through with Universal yet, but, you know, they wanted... Well, they ended, the up, in the, they ended the, up in the Lakeside Building. And the Lakeside Building the, was called the Lakeside Building. I think of the new Lakeside Building, and then there was the, the one that was over there on the Universal lot. That yeah, they, I don't think Jeffrey knew at that point how good the talent is we had in London. Maybe our movies were not as good as they they could have been but our talent was first the, rate the talent was good yeah because a lot of them came, I think most of them came over and they were sort of the core group mm. of DreamWorks in those early days and so when you swing over what are you doing at DreamWorks animation in the in, in the early days I mean what uh, well I was working with Brenda and Simon we were directing on uh, Prince of Egypt and so you were all directing on Prince of Egypt and that was interesting because it was a brand new studio again. So I was used to that. We had just I had just finished a brand new studio with Amblimation. And now this was a brand new, and there was hardly anybody in it. I've got a picture in my my uh, uh, room at work of of DreamWorks when it was like thirty people. Oh yeah, well, I and mean, it was all, and you were all in that one building on yeah. the side of the hill. I used to come over there mm -hmm. and and go through it. The Lakeside and, Building. Uh, yeah. And I've talked to people that were there then, and they they always talked to me about the sense of excitement and mm -hmm. the cohesiveness and and all of that stuff. And uh, and it was Stephen's idea to do Prince of Egypt, right? It wasn't wasn't it? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, that came from that Stephen.